Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. Amen. Y'all give them a hand. Amen. Man, I love what God's doing in our worship. And just to kind of let you know where, where we are in this process, uh, we are transitioning into the new year of uh, using our own people. And uh, we spent the last six months working with a, a team uh, that has invested in them, and we're going to continue to work with them. But uh, Brian and Jeff and Danielle and some of these guys that have helped lead us over these last six months uh, are going to take the lead over these next few months. And so we're excited about what God's doing and how he's going to use that. And so y'all keep praying for those guys. Pray for us that we would uh, have the wisdom to know what to do and uh, how to do this and develop people and develop talent. And I think it's, uh, it's exciting to see what God's doing. So uh, the other thing I want to say to you about our budget is some of you have asked about our shortfall uh, of our budget. And so I, I firmly believe by faith that we're going to make that up in the next two weeks. And so if you want to go ahead and write a check for that amount... Uh, Anybody? Anybody? Um, going once? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so just be faithful in that. We, we've always met budget in our at 15 years that I've been your pastor, and uh, it's been fun to watch how God does that. Sometimes he does that supernaturally, and sometimes he just does it in those just faithful giving. And so I just encourage you to be faithful in that because we're not done. Uh, we're not done in this community. I sat last night at our re-engage marriage uh, share time last night, and I was so stinking blown away uh, of listening to those testimonies. And every year that I get to do that and be a part of that vow renewal uh, process of just seeing those couples go through that. Some were right on the verge of going, I'm done. And others were like, man, I'm just, we're about an eight. We want to be a nine. And, and I love hearing those two stories from those two extremes of going, I'm done, to I just want to be a better marriage and seeing those come together. And, and guys, that's just a part of what we do around here in our, our community is we help marriages, we help couples, we help singles, we help teenagers and children and we feed people and uh, it's just it's so cool to watch what God's doing here in the miracle in the cow pasture is what we call it amen so if you're visiting here this morning welcome to the miracle in the cow pasture um, this is what we call it if you don't know that just look around when you leave and you'll see why we call it that because uh, there's really nothing out here uh, so God's doing a cool thing well last week we started a new series uh, called simply Christmas and we started talking about doubt and I know that seems like a weird thing to talk about at Christmas and because uh, everybody loves a Christmas story. That's why some of you are here. That's why some of you show up this time of year and because uh, you want to hear the Christmas story and, and Charlie Brown is good, but you want to hear it from the Bible and, and we know that. And so last week we kind of started that, that just talking about there are some people in our culture and, and there's some people that even sit in this room that struggle with doubt they're not real sure. I mean, that, that whole Jesus thing and virgin birth and all that stuff that, that we talk about this time of year, there's some people out there, and I know some of you just believe it because the Bible says it, and I don't want to discount that, and we'll get that in just a minute, but, but for some people out there, they're really wrestling with that. In fact, I told you last week in the conversations that we have, there's always that whole idea that, that when you ask people, have you read the New Testament or have you read the, the, the Gospels? And so many times people that say they don't believe will just admit, no, I've never read the whole Gospel. I've never read the Scriptures. In fact, in conversation with seekers, sometimes people will, will struggle with this whole idea that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, where Paul said, but we preach Christ crucified. And he said this, to the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. You see, the mysterious death of Jesus was a stumbling block. 
But then again, I would say this, the mysterious birth of Jesus is also a stumbling block, right? I mean, think about it. More often than not, this whole idea of the virgin birth, <laughs> when you talk to somebody and they look at you and go, oh, you're one of them. Yeah, you ever had somebody look at you that way? When you talk about the virgin birth and they're like, oh, <laughs> you know that's not possible, right? And we've all had that happen, don't we? As much as we love to have Mary on the front of our Christmas cards and it seems that we've only added her as the wink, you know, and like, oh, well, yeah, you know, we need Mary on there and it's kind of part of it. And, um, and so, sir, some of us, we, we love the idea of Mary, but we really don't know how to explain Mary, the virginity. And it just seems kind of far-fetched. And that's where we started last week with doubt and, and we started looking at those things. And if we, if we looked at Mary and the virgin birth as being too far-fetched, we would actually be missing one of the most important doctrines of the incarnation of God, of all scripture. If we take the virginity of Mary and the fact that, that God did something in her to cause where he would leave heaven and come and be one of us, and if we discount that or we, or we get rid of the virgin birth and we miss the foundational part of the incarnation of God. And yet, for some of us, we don't know how to explain it. I mean, the Christmas story is simply this. It's found in Matthew 1, and it's found in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to kind of go back and forth this morning and look at that. You don't find it anywhere else in the Gospels, but it's in Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 2, and you know the story, but just in case you forgot it, okay, let me remind you that it begins with the account of an angel appearing to a young, lower, middle-class, engaged woman named Mary, right? And even though she was a virgin, she was going to give birth to the Messiah, and we know that from Luke Luke chapter 2, look at it with me. In Luke chapter 2, verse 26, it says, In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin planned to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgins, everybody say virgin. I know it seems weird to say that in church, doesn't it? Last week, I wish you could have seen my daughter's faces uh, in the second service. Some of you guys don't get to see that, but my daughter's always said up front, and I said next week, I'm going to talk about virginity. And uh, my daughters immediately looked at each other and said, we're not coming, and because uh, they don't like to hear their dad talk about that. And so uh, the virgin's name was Mary. Now, the claim that Christ entered the world by a virgin gets many different responses. Let me, let me give you four of them. Number one, some argue that the virgin birth is absolutely impossible because there are those in our culture that believe miracles do not happen, period. Miracles do not happen. Now, I don't know if they're blind. I don't know if they're just not, um, um, how do I say this, um, awake or alive or, or what, but there are actually some people out there that believe it's all coincidence. And so when they see something like this, they go, look, man, Mary was not the first or the last person that's ever gotten pregnant. Uh-oh. And so there's some people out there that just believe she made the whole thing up and she got pregnant. And so she made this story up, God got me pregnant. And just as that would go over in our day, there are some that believe that's what she did. There's another group of people out there that believe and acknowledge that miracles happen. But for some whatever reason, they just don't think this miracle took place because we're smart people, right? And they'll sit there and go, we're smart people. We know how biology works. We know how the world works and we're medical people. And we know people just don't get pregnant. And they argue that the term virgin was just really applied to Mary because she was young. And there are more people in this second camp that even imagine that there are a whole lot of pastors and ministers that fall into this camp right here that believe that, yeah, miracles happen, but this miracle really didn't happen. And really what the word virgin means is young, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Because see, if you affirm the scriptures, if you believe the scriptures, and if you are a believer in this room this morning, I'm not assuming that all of you are, when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you're signing up to acknowledge more than a few supernatural events. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. 
I mean, you look at the supernatural, what about the resurrection, right? So you're not gonna believe the virgin birth, but you'll believe in a resurrection. Now, okay, anyway, uh, what about the parting of the Red Sea? Well, that could have been reeds. No, it was water because people don't drown in weeds, they drown in water. Can I get an amen? amen. I'm, just, I'm just saying, Jesus believed it, so I'm gonna believe it because he predicted and pulled off his death and resurrection. So I'm, I'm gonna go with Jesus, right? And so what about creating everything out of nothing? Remember we talked about that a few months ago? You see, some, when someone starts picking up the editor's pen to, to the Bible, to Scripture, and they decide what to leave out in the Bible and what to mark out, things kind of get goofy. And so if we omit the virgin birth, we don't understand how this one thing undermines the whole narrative of the gospel. See, there's a third group out there that affirms the virgin birth simply because it's in the Bible. They've just reached a point, and I know there's certain folks in this room, and, and I appreciate you so much, but some of you just go, well, it's in the Bible, so I believe it. And I don't want to discount that. I don't, I don't want to push that. But you, I think there's some people that would be hard-pressed to be able to explain the incarnation of God through the virgin birth by simply saying, well, it's in the Bible, so I believe it. Because last time I checked, Jesus' command and his commission was to go and make disciples, that converts were assumed. So when you and I go out and contend for the gospel, not argue for the gospel, because that's, that's a whole nother issue. But when we go and contend for the gospel, that's that push and that pull. That's that space that we leave of those things that we're, we're still struggling with, that when we're contending for the gospel, for us to be able to explain why the virgin birth is so fundamental to the incarnation of God, that God leave in heaven and come and live in a sinless life, being born of a virgin, being able to explain that. And the fourth and final group is made up of those that not only affirm the virgin birth, but also understand absolutely the critical doctrine to the whole superstructure of the gospel. Now, I know those are big words, and I know those are big explanations, but, but let, me, let me make some observations about the virgin birth that may help you today. And we're gonna start in John chapter one. In fact, the virgin birth was the birth of God himself. John chapter one opens up and saying, look at it, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That, that, that word, or logos, refers to Jesus. So in the very first verse of the Gospel of John, we see that in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was Jesus. John didn't write, in the beginning Jesus was created. He did not write, after a little while Jesus was created. No, Jesus was there. He was already created. In John chapter 17, Jesus talks about the glory he enjoyed with the Father before the foundation of the world. In Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul talks about the fact that Jesus was God himself in heaven and enjoyed the glory of God. But Jesus set all that aside in order to take on the human body. He humbled himself to become a man. That's what we call the incarnation. Not simply a man, but also a slave. And not simply a slave, but a slave who is willing to go to his death on the cross. You see, the virgin birth in John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus Christ is eternal. When we talk about the virgin birth, we're not talking about a birth like yours and mine. You see, God doesn't have a shelf full of souls up in heaven that already exists. And he just goes, you know what, I think it's your time. It's time to go, Right? He doesn't have this whole shelf of already these souls already created in heaven where he goes, well, I think, you know, you know John, you've been up there about 2,000 years. Let's go ahead and send you now. No, he created that because here's what we know. Our lives begin at what? Conception. Even science has caught up with the Bible. I challenge you on that. Even science has caught up with the Bible that our lives begin at conception. But Jesus was present at creation. He's eternal. And this is a foundational point. As a matter of fact, that battle has been fought for years. There was a group historically that denied that Jesus was only a man. And Jesus wasn't God, he's only a man. There was another group called the Gnostics that Jesus was appearing to be a man. He was just acting. I mean, think about Jesus acting for 33 years. He needs an Oscar for that. Can I get an amen? I mean, Jesus would need an Oscar for that performance. You see the virgin birth was the birth of God himself, but also the virgin birth was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. I told you a couple of weeks ago, you can't make this up, but the scriptures was put together over all this time period. And you see that men did not get together and go, hey, we're going to come up with this story and you're going to tell this part and you're going to tell this part because it was done over hundreds of years that the Bible was put together. 
And so when we talk about the virgin birth, it's, 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 it's important to understand and realize the story doesn't begin in Luke chapter 2. The story doesn't begin in, in Matthew chapter 1. The story began 700 years before in, in the book of Isaiah, where in Isaiah 7, 14, it says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. What's the sign? The virgin. Everybody say virgin. virgin. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And he and you will call him Emmanuel. Now, some believe that that word virgin means young woman. And that's partially true and it can be misleading. But let me tell you this. The word occurs nine times in the Old Testament. And you need to hear this. Nine times. Of the eight occurrences, near, or nine occurrences, nearly seven of those occurrences refer to a virgin, not simply a young woman. And here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it is clearly spoken when Isaiah says, I'm going to give you a sign. And this is how you'll know for sure that God has sent the Messiah. He clearly uses the word virgin, not young woman. Virgin means someone who's never had sex. I know that's blunt. And so the prophet here is promising that the Messiah would be born to a young woman. No. Because if he said young woman, that doesn't narrow it down. Because do you think other young women had babies when Jesus was born? You think other Hebrew young women had babies when Jesus was born? Do you think other young women from the line of David had babies when Jesus was born? Yeah. So how do you know? Well, the prophet gives a very clear calling. The sign will be born to a virgin. So when the gospel writer Matthew translates that verse from Isaiah 7 verse 14 from that Hebrew word into Greek, the Greek word he uses can only refer to a virgin, not just a young woman. You see, Matthew quotes this verse in that first chapter of the gospel, claiming that all these things will play, take place so that the prophecy, what prophecy? The prophecy from 700 years before would be fulfilled. You can't make that up. You can't hold that theory long enough. See, the New Testament bears witness to the virgin birth as well as the Old Testament. In Luke, the angel says to Mary, look at it in Luke chapter 2, 28 and 34, says the angel went to her and said, greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God and you will conceive and give birth to a son. And you're to call him Jesus and he will be great and he will be called son of the most high. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. The, his kingdom will never end. And how would this be, Mary said? Since I am a what? Everybody say it with me. I'm a what? Again, you see this in the book of Matthew. He develops Jesus' birth around Joseph. Luke develops it around Mary. The angel is, and, and Matthew comes to, to Joseph and, and he tells Joseph, look, man, this is what's happening. He's, he's already gone to, to Mary and saying, this is what's happening. And, and Mary's like, well, I can't deny it. I'm pregnant. And Joseph's over here is going, uh, I don't know about this. And, and, and so you see this dichotomy that's going on. And Matthew just assumes, and Gabriel just assumes that Joseph would believe him. And it's just, it's crazy. Can can you imagine the shock for Joseph? Can you imagine that? To find out? You see, Mary went away for three months to her cousin Elizabeth and didn't see Joseph and comes back and goes, uh-oh, Joe, I'm pregnant. How do you think he felt? And then for her to come back and insult him, God did it. Can you imagine that? What a shock. You see, you see, sometimes I think we miss the, the idea of this because engagement in Hebrew culture is so different than ours. Engagement in the Hebrew culture is so different than ours. In essence, when you were engaged in the Hebrew culture, you, you, you were basically married. So here's what that happened. If your fiance died during this year of engagement, you were considered a widow. If, if you were unfaithful to your fiance, then, then you could be put to death. In other words, engagement in the Hebrew culture was very serious. Now, I know it's serious in our culture too, but you're not going to be put to death for breaking up. Amen? This was serious. You see, in Matthew's account, when Mary comes back from visiting her Aunt Elizabeth for three months, she's pregnant. Joseph knows he's not the father. He knows there's no way. She's been gone. And so what does he do? He makes plans to divorce her. 
to put her away. And the angel Gabriel is sent to him, to Nazareth, to stop Joseph from ending the road slip. Look at Matthew chapter 1. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. In other words, after he considered what Mary said, Mary comes back and I'm pregnant. And by the way, God did it. And, I, and Joseph's going, yeah, right. And he's having this conversation. So after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You see, not only does the Old Testament and the prophecies of the Old Testament fulfill it, but also the New Testament. But see, I think one of the things that the virgin birth says to all of us is that God was specific. He was very specific. We know that God was concerned about man in general. After all, I mean, God is love and he's the giver of life and, and we acknowledge that God is love and it would be easy to believe that God loves and he loves people, and, but God could have done it in any other way. You know, God could have rode across the sky in the clouds every day for us to look up into the clouds and say, by the way, I love you. Wouldn't that be a great sign if God did that? He could have done that. He could have rode across the sky maybe in a rainbow. He could have the stars line up at night that lines up instead of the Big Dipper and that bear, which I've never found that bear in the sky. But anyway, they call it a bear. And, and instead of having all of those things up in the sky up there, God could have lined all the stars up at night and go, Jesus is Lord. And some of you are going, well, that, that would really work for me. <laughs> instead, God got very personal. He did it in the incarnation. Let me tell you how specific God got. He took a teenage girl and a carpenter who were engaged to be married, two ordinary people, so it seemed. And you see the virgin birth, by God getting so personal, he went back into a lineage because he predicted it would be from the line of David. And he brought it all the way forward. In fact, we don't read the first 17 verses of Matthew very often, do we? Why? Because it's a genealogy. And, and most of us in this room, unless you have a Bible degree, can't pronounce those names. And I don't think anybody names their kids after any of those names, right? In the first few verses of Matthew, because it's a genealogy. But it's a distinguished genealogy because there's, there's some names in there. Abraham and Jacob and, and Judah and David and, and Solomon, this kingly line that we see here. And Joseph was a descendant of those men. In other words, Joseph was royalty. And it was a long line of power. And so when God came and got so specific with this carpenter and this little girl who were engaged to be married, is that he brought this long line of very personal royalty to bring Jesus from God into, from heaven into, from there to here that Jesus would be the only one rightfully that owns the kingdom of David. Now you think about that and you think about all the things that God lined up and how specific he, he got. You know, when I look at that in Matthew chapter one, the virgin birth says the prophets were right. You see, all kinds of religions contain prophecy. That's not new. All kinds of religions contain prophecy. But what's unique about Christianity is the prophecy of the virgin birth. And it was fulfilled. In Matthew chapter 1, 22 and 23, now all of this took place that was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translates God with us. God with us. See, the Bible is distinctly unique in that it contains specific prophecies which were fulfilled independently of the author. See, 700 years, Isaiah made that prophetic word and never got to see it fulfilled. And 700 years later, it was fulfilled. It's amazing me for when you start looking back at all the prophecies concerning Jesus. In fact, let me mention a few that he would be a Jew from the tribe of Judah, that he would be the son of David. He would be born in Bethlehem. I mean, they got specific and yet he would come out of Egypt and he would also be known as a Nazarene. And even the date of his coming is alluded to as well as Herod's assassination attempt. But the most unique prophecy of all was that he was born to a virgin. 
that there were other Jews from the tribe of Judah, other descendants of David, other children who were born in Bethlehem during this time. In fact, some probably came out of Egypt and, and some were known as the Nazarene and some weren't even being born at this time of history, but it is this prophecy that makes him distinct, born of a virgin, conceived by the breath of God. And the amazing fact that it was told by a Hebrew prophet 700 years before the birth of Jesus. I mean, do you see the implication here? For some of you that don't believe God is faithful, God is a God who keeps his word 700 years before. In fact, if you go all the way back to the Genesis account, God even predicted then that he was going to send one. And all through scripture, you see, and all through the Old Testament, you see the prophecies where God fulfilled those. And so the implication for us is, is that when he speaks, it comes to pass, but you may not see it in your lifetime. You see, that's the problem with modern day Christianity is that, that we have an entitlement that we can tell God to bark and God will bark. We can tell God to sit and God will sit and God to do and God will do. The problem is God's going to do what he does and he's faithful. And we see that in scripture, that we can believe in him, that when he makes a promise, he's going to fulfill it and he's not going to break it. He's not going to start with you. You're not that unique, by the way. Isn't that amazing that we think we're unique, that God's going to break our promise? You see, look in the manger, he's there. And look in the tomb, he's gone. God keeps his word. Amen. God keeps his word. You see, the virgin birth means that God is with us. In, in Matthew 1, 23, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Yes. Read a story about a little boy this week walking with his dad and Last night I got to hang out with my son and my, my girls were out and had one turn 15 this week and so they all went and played at the mall and all that. Thank you to Jesus. I didn't have to go and so um, <laughs> trying on clothes and doing all that. Anyway, um, and so I read the story this last week and I thought about my son last night and uh, this little boy was walking with his dad and the, the dad looked at the son and said, son, where are we? And the little boy said, I don't know. So the dad looked at him and said, do you know how far it is from home? He goes, no, not really. And the father asked the son, said, do you know what direction we need to go to get home? And the son said, nope. The father looked at the son and said, well, son, you must be lost. And the son says, no, how can I be lost when you're with me? How can I be lost if you're with me? You see, when the father's with us, you may not know where you are. And some of you are there, right? In fact, you never thought you would be here, here at Summit. Let's get specific, right? Because you said 20 years ago, you'd never go back to church. And how many people have walked back into this building and go, I never thought I'd be here. In fact, I don't even know why I'm here. And we're so glad you're here, by the way. This is safe. But listen, you may not know where you are, but you can never be lost. You see, ultimately, that's what Christmas is about. Ultimately, that's what Christmas is about, is you can never be lost if you're with the Father. You can never be lost. It's not about gifts or credit cards or wrapping paper or Amazon, God forbid. <laughs> or jolly old Santas. It's about a time that God came near. Right. The incarnation of God to, to leave the heavenlies and, and come and live among us. When heaven touched earth, yes. when he lived among us, that you and I now through him who are on earth can know heaven. You see, the virgin birth means that we have salvation. In Matthew 1, 21, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will what? Everybody say it with me. He will what? Save his people from their sins. Notice that Jesus is, has a special significance. In fact, that Hebrew name literally means Yahweh saves, that God's going to save us. And he's going to save us from sins that we need to be saved from. Not mistakes, not alternative lifestyles, not even psychological issues, but sins, active and outright rebellion against God. That he saves us because we've all sinned and we all continue to fall short of God's standard. And we're real people who commit real sins. And by the way, that's bad news. And to make it worse... Our sins separated us from God. And you may be there today. 
And our sins cry out for justice. And we know that because there's something about every one of us. And when we see something on TV or we read something on Facebook or Twitter or social media, that there's something in us that rises up, somebody must pay. That is our sins crying out for justice. And by the way, we are sinners. Not they are sinners. We are sinners. But see, the good news is really good. The good news is that we have a Savior. Because that's what Christmas was about. Yahweh saves. Not a good example. Not a teacher. Not even a probation officer. I've had one. Amen. <laughs> a savior. Several years ago, my brother was involved in a boat accident. My brother's been working for um, Skeeter and Nitro and Mako and Tidewater and Tidecraft and Pro and all these different boat companies for over 30 years. And when he was working for Skeeter... They used to take boats out into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, you fishermen, uh, that's like a dream come true. And they would do rough water testing. I'll never forget, we got a phone call one day. And this was years ago uh, that my brother was missing. A storm had blown in in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, they couldn't find him. After about 11 hours of searching, the Coast Guard found him almost seven miles from where he was last spotted. When that storm came in, a wave hit the back of his boat and broke the motor off the back of his boat, slamming his head into the center console, knocking out his teeth, and he laid in that boat until he drifted on a sandbar. And I'll never forget just talking to him about that, and, and we still talk about it today because we love boats and we love going fast and all that. But, uh, I, you know, one of the things we were talking about is he thought it was so cool that when that helicopter showed up, and it was the Coast Guard. And can you imagine getting saved by the Coast Guard 11 hours at sea, not knowing if you're ever going to see your kids again, not knowing if you're ever going to see your wife again. And, and, and what was unique is, is when the rescuers showed up and they came over to my brother, here's what didn't happen. They didn't look at him and say, hey, you doing okay? Hey, bud, if you'll just get out and swim that way, there's the shore. <laughs> that would have been a guide but not a savior, right? How about, how about this? What if they just tossed down a book on how to swim? You see, my brother can't swim. It's unique. My brother builds boats for a living and he can't swim. It's kind of crazy. I'm like, what is wrong with you, bro? Anyway, he doesn't swim. So I imagine that those Coast Guard just kind of, kind of, hey, bro, here's a book. This is how you swim. See, that would be a teacher, but not a savior. How about this one? If one of the rescues jumped in the water and said, hey, John, this is how you do the backstroke. Come on, bud. Let's do it. Because, see, that would have been a great example, but it wouldn't have been a savior. Or let's just say my brother was brought up into the helicopter. And halfway back, <laughs> they pushed him out and said, you can do it. That would be a probation officer, right? <laughs> you know, fortunately... My brother didn't get a guide, he didn't get a teacher, he didn't get an example or probation officer. What my brother got was a savior. He got a savior. And you and I have one too, and his name is Jesus. He came as a baby. He didn't stay that way. The virgin birth took place so that God could take on flesh and die in our place. And he couldn't be conceived by man because then he wouldn't have been perfect. He was conceived by God. And he took on flesh and he took our guilt and our sin and he made the supreme sacrifice. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, look at it. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Everybody, such an act like that calls for a response. Yes. Uh, now, just li listen to me for a minute. I know some of you, you're only here because she told you to come. Uh, and I get, and I'm, I'm so glad you're here, okay? But listen to me. When you, when you think about all that went into, God's not a God. He's not a probation officer. He's not a teacher. He's not just an example. He's our Savior. He took what was not his on him for us. I remember I asked my brother, what'd you say when you got into the helicopter? What'd you say? He said, I couldn't say anything. I was just so grateful. I was 
just so grateful that I had been saved. And you know what? I'm grateful too because he'll be here next Saturday. And I only get to see him once a year. And I'm so grateful that he didn't get a guide that day. He was saved. And you see, you and I can be saved if we realize that the unique claims of Jesus are for you. Born of a virgin. That he took on our sins so that you and I could be in relationship with God. See, if you've never come to Jesus in faith and repentance, then I would invite you to respond this morning. In fact, I don't care how long you've gone to church. Some of us have gone to church so long and know all the right answers, but we have never surrendered our life to Jesus Christ. You may have walked the aisle. You may have even gotten wet at one point. But you know, you know. And listen, if you're a part of something, you know I don't push this hard very often. But you know there's something in you missing. And I would invite you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian in this room, I want to ask the band to come on back. If you're a Christian in this room and you've just kind of gotten caught up in all the Christmas hustle and bustle and debt and trees and presents and glitter, I invite your response to stop and remember that it was through that little girl and that little carpenter that you and I have the hope and the peace that we have today. That we would respond in a way that would be appropriate as we party, as we open gifts, as we toast. That we'd remember it was that God left heaven to come to earth so that you and I could leave earth and be in heaven with him. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. And I thank you today for that truth. And Lord, I know that as I've studied this last week and gone through all my books and prayer and the virgin birth is complex. The doctrine is complex. The simple truth is that you chose a little girl to send your son Jesus. And she was a virgin. So that we could know you through him and his sacrifice. If you're lost today and you're lost in the crowd and you feel like your prayers aren't getting past the ceiling, I'd ask you this question and we're gonna respond. Do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? And if you don't, we're gonna have some folks across the front in just a moment. I would invite you to come and grab one of them and say, I need Jesus. I wanna surrender my life to Christ. And I invite you to do that today, to come to him today. I would invite those who know Jesus and have a relationship with him. If you're new to Summit, we take communion every week to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. And so we have two tables at the front on each end and two tables at the back. And it's, uh, it's self-serve that you can go and take communion and uh, enjoy that and worship God. And we would invite you to do that. You don't have to be a member of Summit Heights to do that. As long as you have a relationship with Jesus, we invite you to take communion. And maybe you need to spend some time in prayer with your group and that. We would invite you to respond appropriately. So, Lord, we love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for a chance to respond. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for that little girl, Lord, that chose to uh, be obedient. Thank you for Joseph, Lord, that chose to be obedient. God, you used that little ordinary couple to usher in your kingdom that we may know you today. So God, I pray for that one that's still doubting. Give them courage. Pray for that one that right now is so stinking ready to have you in their life. God, give them courage to come down the aisle. 
as the rest are moving to take communion, God, give them courage to come to one of these prayer teams. Lord, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask it in his name. And everybody said. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.